2001. It's a day in U.S. history that many will not forget. It's a day in U.S. history that many will not even know. They'll only know of it. They will not know what it was really like to have lived it. This is my story. This is my recollection of that day. It's a story that was full of distress and trauma and angst and anxiety for a lot of days. So let me begin. I was living in Westchester County and I used to commute down to Wall Street every day. I had a routine. I'd get on the 450 train out of North White Plains. I'd arrive at Grand Central at 535. I'd walk across the, um, the big lobby at Grand Central and then down the stairs to the number four and five train, the subway train that would take me down to Wall Street. Those are the express lines and I could go from Grand Central to Wall Street in about 15 minutes. It made uh, four stops, 42nd Street I got on, 14th Street, Fulton Street, Brooklyn Bridge, and then Wall Street. I used to come up out of the stairs at Wall Street and before I entered the exchange, I would stop on the corner of Wall and Broadway to the coffee cart. And it appeared as if the same people would show up at the same time every day. And every day at six o'clock, I would see these two guys, this young woman. I didn't know their names, but I knew them. I knew them because I saw them nearly every day. We all happened to be on that same schedule where we would show up at the coffee cart at six o'clock in the morning. And everyone would get their coffee and their donuts. And there's nothing like New York City coffee cart coffee. Uh, I think it's the best coffee in the country. But, you know, I'm being biased. But one way or the other, I would get my coffee and then I'd walk over to my office. Now, I spent my days working on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as an institutional broker. I became a member of the New York Stock Exchange in August of 1985. I started working there in the summers of 1980. And I retired from there in the winter of 2019. So I spent nearly 40 years of my life at the New York Stock Exchange. I met my wife. I ran a number of businesses there. I met people that impacted my life all along the way. But in the mornings and at night, I had an office at Two World Trade Center. My office was on the 55th floor overlooking the Hudson River. So I walked in my office and I looked out the window. I looked directly across the river into New Jersey. It was a spectacular office, not because it was spectacular in decor or style. It was just spectacular because it was on the 55th floor of the World Trade Center in New York City. The address alone, you know, would, would make anybody proud. It was magical. It was, it was really an incredible place to um, call home, right? Call my office. Well, I had a partner. We started this firm in uh, April of 1998. It was a brokerage firm on the New York Stock Exchange where we serviced in the institutional community and, and the broker dealers from around the country. But our main bread and butter was serving the asset manager, the institutional asset manager. So hedge funds, mutual funds, pension plans, foundations, those kinds of clients uh, were our customers, right? And so in the mornings, I used to go to my office and organize all the work and get ready for the day and do any research I had to do and organize the files. And I used to get to the office every day after I got my coffee and walked over to the Trade Center and took the elevator from the lobby to the 46th floor and then walked around and caught the next elevator from 46 up to 55 and then walked through my office. It was probably about 630 by the time I got there. I took off my jacket, I sat down, I turned on the TV, I turned on my computer, and I did my work. The other four guys that worked with us used to show up anywhere quarter of seven, seven o'clock, and their office was across the hall. It was inside, right, the building. It wasn't an exterior office that had windows in it. It was an interior office. And so they would spend uh, typically 45 minutes to an hour just doing the work that they needed to do every morning. And so on this particular morning, after they got done with their work, they came into my office at about five minutes to eight. 
and said to me, let's go to breakfast over at the exchange. Now at the exchange, you could go to breakfast. It was up on the seventh floor. It was called the Members Luncheon Club. And it was a beautiful old fashioned club, mahogany walls and uh, steeped in, in iconic history of the New York Stock Exchange, right? It was members only. And so we could go there for breakfast or for lunch and uh, you could bring clients there, you could bring customers there, you could bring potential clients, you could bring it, you know, people that are, have breakfast and lunch. And so we used to go to breakfast probably twice a week as a company. And we'd talk about what had happened, you know, the day before, maybe in a trading situation, we'd talk about new clients, we'd talk about what are the clients needs, we talked about sectors and stock action, you know, all the stuff that you would talk about. Me being the senior partner was kind of like the mentor, right? And uh, these guys were eager to learn. And so on this day, they came into my office at five minutes to eight and asked me to go to breakfast with them at the New York Stock Exchange. And I said to them, I can't go today. I said, I've got too much work to do. August had just ended. It was early September. I had bills on my desk and all that stuff that you do when you're wearing, you know, five hats when you run your own business. And so I said to them, no, I said, you guys go. I said, I'll meet you over at the exchange at nine o'clock. I just got work to do. And, you know, you guys go without me. So... They left at eight o'clock and they went over to the elevator. They pressed the button. They went from 55 to 46. They walked around. They pressed the button for the next elevator. They went from 46 down to the lobby. And by the time they got out to the lobby, it was 10 after eight. They start walking across the plaza of the Trade Center on their way to the New York Stock Exchange, which was three and a half blocks east of the buildings, up to Broadway, a little bit south, and then east again down Wall Street to where you came to 11 Wall Street, which is the iconic New York Stock Exchange. And as they started to walk, one of the four, Jonathan says to the other three, listen, you guys go over to the exchange and get a table. I want Kenny to come to breakfast. Now, Jonathan very easily could have picked up his cell phone and called me and asked me once again to come down to breakfast. But I think he knew me well enough to know that the answer would have been no. So what did he do? Jonathan got in the elevator and he came all the way back upstairs. So he comes from the lobby up to 46, 46 up to 55. And suddenly it's, you know, almost 820 and he sticks his head in my office. And I looked at him and I go, Jonathan, what are you doing? I said, I thought you guys went to breakfast. He goes, Kenny, we did. We got all the way outside. It's an absolutely spectacular day outside and everyone's talking and we want you to come to breakfast with us. And I said, Jonathan, I told you I can't go to breakfast. I got too much work to do. You don't seem to understand, but I cannot go. And he said to me, yes, you can go. We will come back at the end of the day. We will help you do whatever it is you need to do. All the bills, all the work, whatever you need us to do, we will come back at the end of the day and help you do that. But you need to come to breakfast with us this morning. Everyone wants you to come to breakfast. Now, look, I spun around the chair and I looked outside the window and it was an absolutely spectacular day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And the sky was that, was that, beautiful blue and the temperature was probably about 65 or 70 degrees that it was a perfect September morning. It could not have been more perfect. When I looked out the window and I saw how beautiful it was outside, I thought to myself, you know, I'm six feet, 235 pounds. I'm starving because I'm always starving. It wasn't like I didn't want to go and eat. I just had too much work to do, but yet he was so insistent that I had to go to breakfast, that I caved, and I said, okay. I grabbed my, my uh, floor smock and uh, my set of keys and walked out of my office at, uh, at about 8.20. We go to the elevator, press the button, go from 55 to 46, 46 down to the lobby, and we start walking across. And now it's about 8.32 when we get out to the plaza in the lobby of the Trade Center. Nothing has happened as of yet. So we walk across the plaza. We walk up to Broadway down south, make a left on Wall Street, walk in the front door, take the elevator up to the seventh floor to have breakfast. At 8.48, when the first plane hit the North Tower, the first plane hit the North Tower going north to south, right? The plane was flying coming from the north and heading south. And it hit the, uh, the, the, the North Tower way up high in the 80s and 100s, right? It spanned about 20 floors. 
Now, you have to understand, I'm three and a half blocks away east of the Trade Centers, way down on the seventh floor. And this plane hit Tower One, the North Tower, way up on the hundredth floor. We didn't hear it. We didn't feel it. I knew nothing. We had no sense at all that something had happened. And we're eating breakfast. We get done with breakfast. We get downstairs. We're, now we're all getting ready to go to work and we get in the elevator. And suddenly the elevator opens at the lobby of the New York Stock Exchange at 11 Wall Street. And you know when there's a lot going on, but you don't really know what's going on. There's all this chaos and confusion and people running around. And so I looked at the security guard and I said, what's going on? What's all the confusion? And he looked at me and he goes, well, you know, a plane flew into the side of the Trade Center. And at that point, you almost want to laugh because it sounds so ridiculous to think that a plane would fly into the Trade Center. It wasn't like you couldn't see them. They were the biggest thing in downtown Manhattan. It wasn't foggy. It wasn't snowy. It wasn't rainy. It was a spectacular day. So you thought to yourself, that doesn't sound right, but... I immediately thought it was a uh, like a little commuter plane. You know, the pilot had a heart attack, flew into the side of the building, the same way that happened in 1946 at the Empire State Building, right? Some single-engine Cessna flew right into the 86th floor. And when I said that out loud, the guard looked at me and he goes, no, Kenny, it wasn't a commuter plane. It was a jet. And I go, a jet? Jets don't fly down the west side of Manhattan. It's just not part of the flight path. It doesn't happen. What do you mean a jet flew into the Trade Center? And he said, go outside and look. And so I walked outside of 11 Wall Street, out the front door. Now, you couldn't see the Trade Centers from the front door of the exchange because of the way the buildings were positioned. But when you looked up in the sky, what you saw was just smoke and crap just flying kind of in the air, which was odd. So I said, I'd better go inside and call my wife and tell her to turn on the TV to tell me what's happening because I was not, I still didn't really understand. Now, unbeknownst to me, what had happened when the first plane hit the tower, friends of mine uh, that you know worked in Manhattan or were in their offices, had televisions on, who had started to witness this whole thing, realized that I had an office in the Trade Center. They didn't know where I was in the Trade Center. They didn't know what building I was in, what floor I was on, and they had already called my wife right after the first plane hit, to tell her to turn on the TV, to ask her what building is Kenny and what floor is Kenny on? Have you heard from Kenny? Call Kenny. And so she couldn't remember because now she's watching this unfold on TV and she's becoming very upset. And so she hangs up the phone and she calls my office and the phone rang and rang and rang because I was not there. And then she called down to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and the guy next door to us who picked up the phone when she asked for me, he said, I have not seen Kenny. By now, it's almost 9 o'clock. It's like 8.58. And he said, Kenny's not here. And he hung up the phone. So when I come in, I pick up the phone. This guy says to me, hey, your wife just called you. So I pick up the phone. I was going to call her anyway. So I dial the phone. She picks up. Now, she's crying when she picks up. And you, know, you could tell somebody who's crying on the other end of the phone. I said to her, Evelyn, why are you crying? You, you need to turn on the television and tell me what is going on. And she starts telling me what's happening. And she starts saying things like Al-Qaeda and they flew a plane into the Trade Center. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around who's Al-Qaeda and what do you mean they flew a plane into the Trade Center? Like I wasn't processing it as she was telling me. And then suddenly my wife starts to screech into the phone, screaming into the phone. And I said to her, Evelyn, why are you screaming? And at that moment that I said that, the second plane, because she was screaming, she was watching on TV as that second plane circled around the South Tower. Now, the second plane, and this is key, the second plane came west to east. As it came through the building, the explosion was thrown out of the east side of the World Trade Center right towards the exchange. Now, the exchange is three and a half blocks away. So exchange was right next to the Trade Center. But the explosion, the thrust was eastwards, right? And the other part of this was the second plane hit the second tower smack in the middle. So my office was on the 55th floor. That plane took out 58 to 78, took out 20 stories because of the wingspan. It went in at an angle. And the explosion, when it came out the, the east side of the building, because it was lower in the building, 
you could feel that one. Unlike the first one, which was way, way, way up high, um, you know, up in the 100th floor, the 90th floor, and it was going south, not east. We didn't feel it, but the second one we felt. And as I'm saying to her, why are you screaming? And then suddenly there was this massive explosion. And an explosion like you could hear it. Now, look, I, I, I had never been to a war-torn country. I've never been around falling bombs. I had no idea what it really sounds like, but now I do. The explosion was so powerful that not only was the sound deafening, but the force of the explosion shook the New York Stock Exchange. The building itself shook. You could feel it. I'm inside on the trading floor with the phone in my hand, with my wife screaming on one end, and then I hear this massive explosion and the building shake. And so now I start screaming at her, saying, what is going on? What is happening? And she's screaming, they flew another plane into the trade center. They flew another plane into the trade center. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around the first plane, never mind the second plane. And then about a minute and a half after that, the alarm at the New York Stock Exchange goes off, right? The, the fire alarm, the evacuation alarm. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Because it was clear that this was not a one-off. It was clear that this was not an accident. And so when you think of America and you think of who we are and what we represent and you think of capitalism and freedom, and democracy. The New York Stock Exchange is right up there as a as a as a piece of America, right? I mean, it is woven into the fabric of the nation. It represents capitalism, it represents entrepreneurship, it represents freedom. It represents infinite possibilities. And so it became apparent to somebody that they should evacuate the exchange because under the circumstances, this clearly was not an accident. And the New York Stock Exchange was only three blocks from where the trade centers were. And if there was something else that was going to happen, it was probably going to happen to the New York Stock Exchange. And so as the alarm sounded, I was on the phone with my wife and I said to her and my daughters were uh, 14 and 11, right? They were in ninth grade and sixth grade. And uh, I said to my wife, because I didn't really understand what was happening and I hadn't still seen it. And I was trying to imagine what was happening. And I just said to her, I want you to kiss the girls and I want you to tell them, always tell them that daddy loves them very much because I didn't know what was happening next. I had no idea if I was coming home. I wasn't coming home. I had no idea what to expect when I walked outside. And I hung up the phone and that was the last time I spoke to my wife until 1230 in the afternoon. So, so much had taken place between nine o'clock and 1230. But we went out the east side of the building because that's the way they evacuated the building because the trade centers were west of the exchange. So they made everybody go out the east side. So we were on Broad Street and we walked up to the corner of Broad and Wall, which is right by Federal Hall. If you've ever been there, the big statue of George Washington and we started to walk east down Wall Street towards the East River. And as we got halfway down Wall Street, there was a certain point on Wall Street where you could turn around and look and you could see the top halves of the trade centers. And it was only at that moment that I saw what everyone else had been seeing and was seeing, were the two buildings engulfed in smoke and flames. And while I could not see specifically the people jumping from the windows, you could see the images of the bodies. And you all know what I'm talking about because there's that, that scene that they played over and over and over on television with the people that were stuck in the building way up high that were hanging out of windows, begging for help and then make the, make the, the final decision to jump or to burn to death. And so these bodies were just jumping out of windows. And it was, I kept rubbing my eyes as I stood there in the street because my brain wasn't processing what I was seeing. Or in fact, it was processing what I was seeing, but I didn't want to believe what I was seeing. I kept saying to myself, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. But yet it was. And so we turned and we walked uh, down to Water Street, which is on the east side of Manhattan along the East River. 
And then we started to walk north because I lived north of the city. It was about 50 miles from downtown. And I was fully prepared to walk all the way home that day because, look, I wasn't getting in a subway. Besides the fact, the subways immediately came to a standstill. So even if they were running, I wouldn't have gone in the subway. And the other thing they did was they stopped all traffic going across the bridges and all that stuff. So now there's all these cars that are stuck on the street, right? And they all had their windows open, like I said, because it was a beautiful day. And so as you're walking down the street, there wasn't pandemonium. There wasn't screaming and people running around. It was just people walking like drones, right? Nobody was talking. And as you walked down the street, you could hear the radio announcer. It was as if the radio was on the same channel. You could hear the radio announcer just repeating and repeating and repeating. In your other ear, you could hear the sound of sirens and ambulances and fire trucks and police vehicles. You could hear those sirens. And then you could hear a pin drop. I mean, it was that surreal, right? And so we walked. And, and I remember I kept trying to use my cell phone. But remember, Tower One, the North Tower, had the big, massive cellular antenna on top of it. And when the plane went through that tower, it completely knocked out the antenna. So now cell phones became essentially useless. And while they still had pay phones in Manhattan on the different street corners, there were actually people lined up waiting to use a pay phone. And I go, I ain't fucking waiting for any pay phone. I'm getting the hell out of here. And so we kept walking and we walked. We were going to walk to Grand Central and then I was going to take a train to go home. So we did that. And uh, we had gone from uh, Wall Street, which is uh, downtown by the Brooklyn Bridge. And between 9 o'clock and 10.01, which is when the first building collapsed, we had gone from, uh, from the exchange when we left all the way up to the Manhattan Bridge, which is Canal Street in Chinatown, which is the second bridge up, right? First is Brooklyn Bridge and is Manhattan Bridge. And when we got to the Manhattan Bridge, we were like on Canal Street, right in the heart of Chinatown. There was this massive rumbling sound and it felt like they were blowing the city streets up. Like I was looking around, I was I was expecting the streets to blow up. Do you remember the movie Independence Day when they were blowing up the city, blowing up the streets? That's what it felt like, this sound of this rumbling sound that that you couldn't identify. And then I thought it sounded like it was coming from above as if there were planes above. And so you're looking up in the sky and you don't see anything and you're looking down the street and you don't see the streets blowing up. But then we had this perfect sight line of the trade centers. And the rumbling sound I heard was the collapse of the building. And while I was probably at this point, I was probably two miles away from the trade center when the building collapsed. It was the rumbling and the destruction of the building that not only you heard, but again, you could feel, right? You could feel this vibration. It almost felt like an earthquake and I was two miles away and you could still feel that, that rumbling. And I remember standing there in the street and watching because the first building to collapse was actually the second building to get hit. And that was the building I was in, right? And the reason that one collapsed first is because it, got hit lower, right? It got hit in the middle of the building, like on the 50th to the 70th floor. So they were another 35 floors above it, all that weight above it, that weakened center section. And so as the flames burned and all that, that building weakened first and collapsed first. And it collapsed nearly an hour to the minute after it got hit. I think it got hit at 9.01 and I think it collapsed at 10.10. And then 10 minutes later, the North Tower collapsed. But what I thought about at that moment as I'm staying there on Canal Street and I'm watching the building like everybody has seen disappear before your eyes and that cloud of smoke that rose in the sky, I thought to myself, that's the building I was in. And if Jonathan had not come back up to get me, that's where I would have died that day because there were four people that I knew who survived the 55th floor of the second tower. So here's what happened. When the first tower got hit, they sounded the alarm in both towers. Now the second building had not gotten hit yet and everyone was supposed to exit the building using the stairways, right? You weren't supposed to use the elevators. And so these guys on the 55th floor, 
took to the stairway and between 8.48 and 9.01 when the building got hit, in that 12-minute time span, they went from 55 all the way down to 25. They were in the 25th floor stairwell when the second plane hit the building. And when it hit the building, they were, you know, 30 stories below where the plane hit. But yet the explosion, the sound of the explosion, the fire, the destruction, and the way the building swayed and knocked people off the stairwell created pandemonium in the staircase. And then suddenly policemen and firemen are trying to go up the stairs while people are trying to come down the stairs only created more chaos. And so I think to myself, where would I have been if Jonathan had not come back to get me? Where would I have been? Would I have been on the 26th floor stairwell? Would I have been on the 24th floor? Would I have been helping somebody? Would I have been behind some? Where would I have been? Anyway, after the building got hit, the four guys from the 55th floor that had descended 30 stories in 12 minutes now took them another 55 minutes to go from 25 out to the lobby. They got out of that building with about four to five minutes to spare before the building collapsed. And so I think to myself again, where would I have been? Would I have been right on their tail? Would I have been separated from them? Would I have stepped onto the plaza if I got out of the building in time? Would I have stepped onto the plaza and been so shell-shocked with what I saw with the bodies falling and the dead bodies on the, on the plaza and the ones that were jumping out of the building and the fire and the destruction? Would I have been so shocked that I froze? And if I froze for more than a minute, I would have gotten caught in the collapse. But I wasn't there. And I wasn't there because Jonathan came to get me. The only reason that I wasn't there. But when I watched it from Canal Street, all these thoughts went through my head. All the people I knew in the building, all the people that I knew around the building. Where were they? What happened to them? Would I ever see them again? And we turned and we started walking again north. Ten minutes later, the same thing happened. You could hear the rumbling, that sound. And we turned around and looked, and that was when we saw the second building collapse in that same fashion, right? As the building fell like a pancake, and then the, the cloud of smoke engulfed all of downtown Manhattan. By this time, we were just north of Chinatown. And now we kept walking and walking and walking. And I got to Grand Central at 12 o'clock. It took me three hours to walk to Grand Central. And when we got to Grand Central, it was closed, right? They had closed Grand Central. They had closed Penn Station um, because there was panic, right? Nobody really knew what was going on. And so um, Jonathan's dad was a lawyer and he had an office right in Grand Central. So we went up to his father's office where I could use a landline because remember, the cell phones still were not working. And so when I got up to the office at 12 o'clock and I was able to use a landline, I called my house. Now, I remember it'd been three hours and there'd been the complete destruction of both the buildings. And my wife and people at my home were witnessing all this, but yet, other than that nine o'clock call to my wife, there was no communication. When I called at 12 o'clock and she picked up the phone crying and I told her I was okay, that I was up at Grand Central, it was not downtown when the collapse happened. I was not caught in the, in the cloud. So she started to cry. And, uh, you know, when my, my older daughter was going to um, private school, the private school was in Tarrytown, New York. And when the event happened, the school went through their records and they looked at all the addresses of the parents of the children at the school. And they looked for parents that had a World Trade Center address. And I had a World Trade Center address. And so what the school did was they went around and they took every child whose parent, mother or father, had a World Trade Center address and they took them out of class. And they brought them to the auditorium. And they said to these kids that there had been um, an accident in Manhattan at the World Trade Center and that these kids needed to call home. They needed to call somebody. And so they didn't really make it any clearer than that, which is, you know, 
I mean, I don't know what I would have done either, but that's how they left it. And so these kids all called home. And when my daughter called the house, it was after I had hung up with my wife in, the, in that in-between time. And she had asked my wife, what it, her mother, what had happened. And so my wife starts to tell her as best as she could that, you know, two planes flew into the Trade Center. And there was all this commotion and blah, blah, blah. My daughter's only question was, where's daddy? Is daddy coming home? And so my wife, my wife said to her, yes, daddy's coming home. But my wife really didn't know if daddy was coming home because all that had happened and she hadn't heard from me and she didn't know whether or not I was dead or alive. If I was caught in the smoke, I wasn't caught in the smoke where I had been. But yet she told my daughter that daddy was coming home. And then they went and they said they went to the school to pick her up and bring her home because they dismissed all these kids. And... Um, after we get done, I called my wife and I called my parents and my parents live in Boston. And then we, we came down from the office and I was going to walk all the way home. And I said to my, first of all, you can't come and get me because they're not letting any cars are not allowed into the city. You know, they blocked everything. I'm fully prepared to walk home and don't you worry about me. And maybe once I get outside of the city limits, outside of the Bronx, then, you know, maybe we can talk about you coming to pick me up somewhere. But until then, I'm walking home. And when we came downstairs, uh, we came down to Grand Central because that's where this office building was. And we realized that they had just decided to open up Grand Central. And they were just screaming at people to just get on a train. Whatever train didn't make a difference, just got on a train and get out. Take the train and get out of the city. So we decided to do that. I didn't walk home. We, we went into Grand Central. I found my train. And if you've ever been to Grand Central, Grand Central is got two levels. It's got a ground level, like when you walk in the building, there's train tracks on that level. But there's also a subterranean level. And uh, naturally, my train was downstairs on the subterranean level. And so I remember getting on the train, and the train was packed shoulder to shoulder. There was standing room only. There was no room for anything. And nobody was talking. You could hear people crying. You could hear people whimpering, you could hear people praying, but nobody was really talking. And so the doors closed on the train. And you know when you're an electric train and the train first starts to move, you know how the sparks fly beneath the train as the train starts to move and then the lights dim and then they go on, they off, they flash, which is nothing out of the ordinary. It happens all the time. Well, so when the doors closed and the train started to move, you had all that, you had the blue sparks and you had the lights that went out and you could hear the people gasp because people were just horrified, right? That very normal action suddenly created all this angst. And then the train makes its way. And it takes 12 minutes for the train to go from the station out to 125th Street, where it comes actually up and out of the tunnel, out into the broad daylight. And when it does that, it comes out of the tunnel and it makes a left and then it makes a right to go north again. And when it makes the left you have this spectacular view of Manhattan, the west side of Manhattan. And on a clear day, you can see from 125th Street all the way down to the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's, it's that spectacular. And so when the train came out of the tunnel and it made that quick left and then the right, you could see everybody in the train crouch down to look out the window to see what they could see. And what they saw was exactly what you all know. I mean, what we didn't see were the buildings because they weren't there anymore. But that plume of smoke that hung over lower Manhattan for hours and hours and hours was all you saw. And then the train turned north and then, you know, it made all its local stops. And it took me an hour and 10 minutes to get to my stop. I get out of the train. I got in the car and I drove home. And when I walked in the door at my house, it was closer to three o'clock. And there were all these people at my house. My wife came over and you know, she was crying and hugged her and kissed her. And my daughter came over and all these friends were there. And I remember I walked into the house and I sat on the couch in the family room because the TV was on and I hadn't seen really 
any of the news. And I sat on that couch for three days. I just didn't even move. I just stared at the television. And all it did was 24 hours a day. It just played and it played and it played and it played. And I just sat on that couch. My mind was racing. As I, as I was, I kept playing it over in my head. And so, if you remember, for those of you who do remember, and for those of you who don't, the New York Stock Exchange um, clearly didn't open on Tuesday, and it didn't open on Wednesday, and it didn't open on Thursday, and it didn't open on Friday. In fact, it didn't open until the following Monday, and even then, it was a miracle that we were able to open because what people don't understand about that moment <laughs> is that the New York Stock Exchange had become this 21st century marketplace. After we went through uh, Y2K at the turn of the century, and after we made it through that and the world didn't implode and technology didn't fail, then the push to modernize US capital markets was on, right? The rest of the world had already modernized. Europe was trading in, in computers and decimals back in the late 80s, and Asia was trading with computers and, and decimals back in the late 80s as well. The United States and New York Stock Exchange was still trading face-to-face, man-to-man, pen-to-paper, and eighths of a dollar, which then converted to sixteenths of a dollar right before the turn of the century. And then after we went through the turn of the century, that's when we started to convert to decimals and introduce automation to the process because it was all about efficiency. How can we use computers to become more efficient? Because that's what that's what we used computers for at the time was about efficiency. And so using computers for efficiency was great because it streamlined the system. It was how to send order flow to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange efficiently, right? So it came via computer right into a handheld or it came into an order management system where it went directly to the specials booth for execution and all that. So it was all great, but what we hadn't done, and that became obvious at 9-11, was really create a backup system, right? There was no backup system. There was no plan B. Because first of all, who in their right mind could have even have imagined an event like this happening. I, I mean, it was, uh, it, it's still mind boggling. But anyway, so what had happened, and here's the point, is that when we became so efficient, all the T1 lines and the phone lines and the cable lines that were connected to the New York Stock Exchange that now connected all of these servers and computers and 21st century phones out to the world, all those cables and wires that ran from the exchange ran through the belly of the Trade Center, out underneath the Hudson River, and then out to the world. And so what happened when the Trade Centers collapsed is that all that connectivity was severed, right? It was all destroyed. The New York Stock Exchange, which had become this 21st century marketplace that was so efficient was using computers and showing the world how forward-looking we were and everything had now become neutered. Because while you could turn the computers on, you could turn the lights on at the New York Stock Exchange, you got zero information flow because all well, the wires got severed. And so essentially, the New York Stock Exchange became neutered. And thus, the U.S. capital markets became neutered. Nothing traded. And you couldn't trade anything because you couldn't trade at the very core stocks, right? Because everything kind of feeds off of stocks um, at the very core. And since the New York Stock Exchange now was neutered, you couldn't just trade NASDAQ names because what are we going to do about, you know, Verizon and IBM and, and uh, ExxonMobil that traded on the New York? Because at the time, New York Stock Exchange stocks could not trade or did not trade on NASDAQ, and NASDAQ stocks did not trade on New York. That is different today, and that's a direct result of the events of 9-11, and, and so we're going to get into that. And so what happened was we, we, you know, we shipped in telephone guys and cable guys and computer guys from around the country to work around the clock to get the New York Stock Exchange connected back out to the world and up and running. And here's the most amazing part of this. 
9-11 was on Tuesday. We opened the following Monday, which was literally six days. And in six days, in the middle of all that disaster and destruction that had taken place just three and a half blocks away, men and women were working around the clock to rewire the building. They were working around the clock to take the brokerage houses that were located in the trade center or in the buildings that surrounded them that got damaged, that could no longer function. And they all had to be relocated because you couldn't open up the US markets and say to Merrill Lynch or Dean Witter or Lehman Brothers, oh, I'm sorry, you can't play. Sorry that you lost your office, but you can't play. Uh-uh, doesn't work like that. And so it was amazing to me the way the city, well, the way the city came together, the way the country came together. And so the financial services industry invaded the uh, the meatpacking district in, in uh, Manhattan. It's on the west side, like 14th Street, right? Which is now a very fancy place. But then it was, you know, old abandoned warehouses. And what was great about the old abandoned warehouses, they were these big, massive warehouses. And so the city and the industry just set up picnic tables and Bloomberg sent all kinds of Bloomberg machines and Verizon sent all kinds of telephones and they literally, in six days, rewired all of downtown. Downtown meaning the exchange, right? Um, and all the brokers that were located downtown because they were dead set on opening the exchange on Monday because here's the other thing you have to understand. You're somebody who's worked your whole life. You're 60 years old. You've worked your life. You have money invested in your retirement plan. It's all invested in the stock market. On Monday, that account is worth $5 million. And then Tuesday, this event happens. And the market doesn't open. And now there's all this talk about terrorism and Al-Qaeda and all this speculation. And so now you start to get anxious. And so you call your broker on Wednesday morning and you say, I want to sell all my stock. I don't want to own GE and ExxonMobil and IBM, which are all fine U.S. companies. But when people get afraid and they get nervous, they'd rather have cash in hand. And they don't want to own a piece of paper that says you own something that's worth something, they don't want that, they want cash. And so when you call your broker on Wednesday and say, I want you to sell all my stocks and your broker said, I can't because the markets are closed. There's no trading, you can't sell your stocks. You say, okay, and then on Thursday you call the broker and you say, okay, I wanna sell my stocks today. And the broker says, you can't sell your stocks. And now what's happening is now you're starting to get anxious right? Because on Monday, your account was 5 million. Then this event happens on Tuesday. And now you don't really know what your account is worth. And you know that everybody else feels like you. And you know that the market's going to come under pressure. And you don't know when the market opens, if your account that was worth 5 million on Monday is going to be worth 4 million, 2 million, 3 million, 1 million by the time the market opens. And with every passing day, there was building and building anxiety. And then think about this. Like we do here in America, you want to invest some of your money in Europe or some of your money in Asia, you can do that. Now, whether you do it directly with individual companies that you buy that trade in Europe and Asia, or you do it through international mutual funds, however you do it, ETFs, whatever, Europeans and Asians do the same thing in the United States. Europeans invest money in U.S. stocks. Latin Americans invest money in U.S. stocks. You're somebody in Asia. This event happens and you call your broker in Asia and you say, I want to sell my U.S. stocks. And that broker says to you, I can't. And then you're in Europe and you call your broker in Europe and you say, I, I want to sell my U.S. stocks. And you're told you can't. Now, do you understand what's happening? Do you understand how the, the panic and the tension is now starting to build? It's not just a U.S. panic now. Now it's becoming an international panic. And we knew this. This wasn't on the headlines. This wasn't on the front page of the New York Post. No one was really telling you why the New York Stock Exchange wasn't open. It, it was almost unspoken. Everybody assumed it was because of the severity of the event. Now, it was because of the severity of the event, for sure. But can you imagine if the headline read, New York Stock Exchange unable to open because of severed communication lines? There would have been panic, which is why you never saw that headline, which is why everybody in the industry and the government tried to control the narrative about what was happening. And the exchange was targeting Monday to open up. The country was trying to deal with this tragedy that happened. Everybody just needs to keep calm. Meanwhile, keep calm was because they were working around the clock to rewire the place to get it to open because there was no plan B. And you couldn't trade 
New York Stock Exchange stocks on NASDAQ because you couldn't. The rules didn't allow that. Today, it's different. Today, you can trade them anywhere. You can trade NASDAQ stocks on New York. Today. New York stocks on NASDAQ, you can trade them everywhere. That may have happened anyway, but it was actually the, the fire got lit as a result of this event. And I don't think Al-Qaeda or whoever was behind the attack knew that that was the case. I don't think they knew, oh, wow, all these, all these wires go through the trade center. They didn't know that. That was one of the unintended consequences. But in fact, what it started to do is it started to affect the global financial markets because look, money trades 24 hours a day, right? Sunday night in New York is Monday morning in Asia. So every week trading starts in Asia. When you're tucking yourself in bed on Sunday night, traders across the Asian region are waking up They're going to their offices. They're getting ready to trade stocks. And then as the sun sets on Asia, it rises in Europe. And then the Europeans, you know, they get ready. They get up. They start trading their stocks. And as the sun begins to set in Europe, it rises in America. And then we get up and we go to work and we start trading our stocks. So when the sun sets in America, it rises once again in Asia and the process starts all over. And so what happened when this event happened, they took the whole United States out of the bank. Not a single product in the United States traded. Not an interest rate, not a commodity, not a treasury, not a stock. Nothing, nothing, nothing traded. So the whole U.S. capital market system came to its knees. And so when you have these three major market centers, you have Asia, you have Europe, and you have the United States as the three developed major market centers, the United States being clearly the biggest out of those three. But when you take the United States out of the game, and so trading starts in Asia on Wednesday morning, and then it goes to Europe on Wednesday afternoon. And when it's supposed to come to the United States, it can't because there's nothing open. It's like the doors are shut. And so trading just stops. And then it's stunted then, right? It starts to affect trading in Asia and Europe, even though those markets were open, Because we were not part of it, because we were not trading, it started to affect the way that global financial markets traded. And so that started to build the anxiety. And so these guys work 24-7. And what I think is amazing is I have a problem with my Verizon at my house. I can't get Verizon to come to my house in six days. Meanwhile, in six days, they rewired basically the U.S. financial system, you know, at the New York Stock Exchange for stocks, right? They didn't they didn't have to wire interest rates and treasuries. So it was about the stocks because stocks are at the very core of the U.S. capital market system. We had to come in on Saturday and Sunday. We had to test our systems. We had to test our computers. We had to test our phones to make sure they were going to work. And it's one thing to test those systems on Saturday and Sunday when the market's not really open. But on Monday when we came to work, that was going to be the test. That was really going to be the test whether or not these men and women that put this all back together with spit and band-aids, whether or not it was going to succeed or fail. And so Monday the 17th was a really, really difficult, emotional, draining day. People that could come back to the New York Stock Exchange came back, right? There were some people who just chose not to come back because they were too freaked out, so they weren't ever going to come back to Manhattan, or they weren't going to come back to the exchange, or they weren't going to go back downtown. There were other people who clearly could not come back. But the people that could come back came back. And on that Monday morning, they had all these people that worked at the exchange, 5,000 between clerks and brokers and exchange employees all working down on the trading floor. And then they had Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer, who were the state senators, and then congressmen and congresswomen. They had policemen, they had firemen, they had ambulance workers, but they also had uh, this woman from, she was in the army, and she's spectacular, this woman. But she she is in the army, um, and she's not an enlisted person in the army. She's got some big job, and I should actually remember her name. I could actually Google it. Um, I should have done that before I, before I did this, but she was also a singer. And she was an a cappella singer. And they had her in her full uniform up on the bell podium at the New York Stock Exchange on that Monday morning. And at 9.15, they rang the bell once. They just go ding. And everybody knows that when the bell rings just once, that it's time to be quiet. 
because there's some announcement, something's happening. And so the floor goes immediately silent. This woman starts to sing God Bless America. Now she does it completely a cappella. There's no music, there's no band, there's no trumpet, there's no anything. She just stands on the podium and she belts out, God bless America. And when she finished, everybody just bowed their heads. And then Dick Grasso made, who was CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, made some comments about America, about New York, about the tragedy, about coming together, about unifying as a country. It was all that stuff. And then the opening bell rang. And when they rang the opening bell, you could hear 5,000 people in the room go, <sighs> and hold their breath because no one really knew what was going to happen. Everyone expected the onslaught of sell orders, which came. Everybody expected the market to come under pressure. It happened. And it happened immediately. The minute the bell rang, you could hear the hum of the computers. And suddenly you could see the ticker tape start to move. And stocks were trading. And brokers were managing their handheld computers with order flow and executions. And the market came under immediate pressure. And it remained under pressure the whole day. And I think by the end of the day, the market ended up closing down 590 or 600 points. Um, which was, a, which was a huge move in 2001 for the Dow to be down 600 points. Um, and the volume spiked. It was big, big volume. And everyone ran around all day long doing what they needed to do to get it done on behalf of the country. And when the bell rang at 4 o'clock, it was financially, it was, a, it was devastated, right? Because the markets had gotten crushed in terms of prices. But yet, there was this amazing feeling at that moment when the bell stopped ringing at 4 o'clock because you know what? The exchange didn't fail. The cable connections and wire connections didn't fail. We carried on and did the work of the nation at the New York Stock Exchange. And when the bell rang at 4 o'clock is when it became really emotional. And it became emotional in the sense that you could almost feel like on Tuesday, the 11th, we got kicked in the gut and we got kicked really hard in the gut and the whole country fell backwards. And then on Monday, the 17th, at four o'clock when the bell stopped ringing, it was as if the whole country stood up. It was as if the whole country locked arms. You know when you lock arms? It was the whole country locked arms and stood up simultaneously and looked them straight in the face and said, okay, you son of a bitch. You kicked us. You kicked us pretty hard. We fell down. But guess what? Now we stood up. And the rest is really history from there, right? Because we stood up and we never went back. And look, trading remained erratic for the days and weeks right after because it was still so so difficult and there was always that talk of a second shoot to drop and what was it going to be and when it was going to happen and where it was going to happen and was it going to happen and so trading was very erratic but the place never failed the place every day got a little stronger and stronger and stronger and then you know from there the rest is history in terms of what the country then did um, but what happened at the New York Stock Exchange after that was the realization that there was no plan B. And here we were, the largest developed market in the world, and we were still operating in a single location in downtown Manhattan with the same 5,000 people that made it run every day. And we were the biggest market center in the developed world. Yet, Europe was already trading using automation. Asia was trading using automation. And those markets are a fraction of the size of the U.S. capital markets. And here we were still trading pen to paper, basically. 
And so out of that event came a couple of things, right? It came the realization that there needed to be a plan B. There needed to be some understanding of how to use technology to create security and stability for the system versus just efficiency. Because up till that point, it was all about efficiency, right? The technology was there because it was efficient. No one thought about, wow, let's use the technology for security and stability. And so after that event, the priority shifted. So now the idea of using technology to provide security and stability took the first position or the first two positions and efficiency part of it, you know, sunk to the third, third spot. And so today we have a very different marketplace, right? We've got a country that now has 11 exchanges. And then we've got 50 plus different dark pools, alternative trading venues, call them what you want. They are not exchanges. They are alternative trading venues. A lot of them are operated by the big banks, Goldman, First Boston, UBS, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And they are huge money makers for those firms because they get to internalize the order flow, which means they get to just trade it amongst themselves without ever exposing it to the capital markets, which, you know, we could have a conversation about that. But what it's provided is a secure and stable platform for the U.S. capital markets. Because look, today, if they came and blew up the New York Stock Exchange, is it a tragedy? It's absolutely a tragedy. Do I think that the markets would be closed for a day? Absolutely. But tomorrow, the markets would be able to open, right? Whether the New York Stock Exchange was able to function or not, because the other 10 exchanges, which are all virtual, they trade in the cloud. There's not a physical location like the New York Stock Exchange. The servers that run all these exchanges are now located all over the country. They're in Colorado and California and Maine and Massachusetts and Florida and Ohio and Kansas and Chicago. They're located everywhere. So if they blow up the New York Stock Exchange, yes, it's a tragedy, but they can no longer cause the whole financial system to come to its knees. Now, look, if they start blowing up the whole country, that's a whole other issue. But then who really gives a shit where Bank of America is trading at that point? Because we have much bigger problems, right? But if they blow up the New York Stock Exchange, tomorrow the markets could open and stocks would trade and you would get the chance to buy them or sell them which is exactly what you couldn't do during 9-11, right? So that created even more panic on top of the panic that was created by the event itself, right? And so today we've got, while I'll say that the system is fractured and fragmented, it is because there is no central marketplace any longer, right? It's all connected by computers, which is why there's hardly any more human beings, at the point of sale, right? In fact, there's less than 200 people today that work at the New York Stock Exchange. The five trading rooms that existed in 2001 no longer exist. It's one room and that's the original trading room in the building that was built in 1903 as the original trading floor, right? It's called the main room. And today it's the only room. And really we use a fraction of the room to trade because the stocks all trade electronically. You don't need that space anymore. And you don't need all those people to help you run it because when it was manual, it was one thing. It's no longer manual. And so, yes, the technology has created tons of efficiency. But today it's also created tons of security and stability. And so for that, as an American, I applaud it. And while it changed the face of the way the U.S. capital markets function and trade, as an American, I have to support it no matter what it did to my business because it, because it destroyed a lot of businesses along the way. But for the greater good of the country, you have to support it and you have to be thankful that it, um, that it exists today because it does protect not only the country, but it protects the U.S. capital system and it protects investors around the world. And so um, today it's a very different world, right? I mean, <laughs> the New York Stock Exchange does exist. I think it will always exist. It is iconic, right, in terms of just its presence and what it is and what it represents. But it is so much a part of the American story. It is woven into the fabric of the country. 
And while many will say, well, we don't need it anymore because it can all be done electronically, guess what? The New York Stock Exchange is an electronic exchange. There are no more people there trading the way in your mind you think it is. It isn't. It's an electronic exchange. And so unlike the NASDAQ, which is also an electronic exchange, it doesn't have a trading floor because it all happens in the cloud, which is why during COVID last year, when the New York Stock Exchange was actually closed for eight weeks, you didn't notice that. The markets continued to trade while no one was at the New York Stock Exchange, while the place was not operating because of COVID. The other 10 exchanges, which operate in the cloud, without humans, continued to trade. And so you see, in fact, it does work, right? It does work with the fragmented technology. And so that's good. And I support that. And and I think every American needs to understand and support that. But that's a part that gets lost in the conversation because most people don't know that part of the story because it wasn't a part of the story that was um, that was told at the time. It was too... It would have revealed the massive vulnerability that the country and, and the industry had. And there you go. I'll say this. You know, it, it took a long time after 9-11 to kind of put the pieces back together and to kind of feel safe again. And while I went to plenty of funerals and wakes during 9-11 for people that I knew, the most difficult part, the most difficult part was trying to understand the people you didn't know. So remember at the beginning of this audio, I talked about how I got to Grand Central in the morning and I took the subway downtown and I would see the same people on the subway platform every morning because we're creatures of habit. We go to the same spot, we sit in the same seat. And then I get to the coffee cart and all of a sudden I see three people who I didn't know their names. I didn't know what her name was or what his name was. All I know is that I would see these people every morning at the coffee cart at six o'clock because that's the schedule we were all on. And while I never knew their name, I knew them well enough to say, hey, how are you? How was your weekend on a Monday morning? Or on a Friday morning, I'd say, have a great weekend. It was those kinds of relationships that you have with people you know, but you don't know. I don't know anything intimate about those people. I don't know about their families, their husbands, wives, their partners, their children, if they have any. And what you realized was after some sense of normalcy returned to the city, to downtown, when the coffee guy came back on the corner of Broadway and Wall Street, when I would get out of the subway and arrive at the coffee cart at six o'clock in the morning to get my coffee and suddenly she wasn't there any longer, the man wasn't there any longer, the other guy never showed up, it leaves you wondering for a long time, what have happened to those people? Are they not there because they got killed that day? Are they not there because they've chosen not to come back? Are they not there for a host of other reasons, I guess. But since you never know the answer to that question, it haunts you, or it haunted me anyway, for a while, right? Because when somebody dies and they bury the body, there's closure there. You know it's over. You see it. You attend it. But when you don't, when you don't know, when you don't understand, when you're unable to, ask the question because you don't even know who to ask. It leaves a void inside of you. And there were days on end when I would just think of all those people that I used to see every day that I no longer saw when you know life returned to normal, whether it was in the subway, whether it was on the train, whether it was at the coffee cart. It took a long time to put that in its right place, right? You had to find the place to put it in the back of your mind. And it didn't mean you didn't think about it. You thought about it constantly. 
and over time it fades and time does heal all wounds but i wonder if time really heals the wound completely and part of me says it doesn't because for so many people the wound is still is still there right it's not completely closed and it may never close it just gets a little bit better and so i wanted to tell that story because i wanted to memorialize it i want my grandchildren to hear it i want other people generations from now to hear it the story of that day from my perspective what happened, how I felt, what it was like, what it smelled like, even though you're not going to be able to smell it, but the description of the burning building and the burning pieces and bodies and that odor, that stench um, washed over lower Manhattan for three months after the after the towers collapsed, that fire burned in the belly of the Trade Center until November. And so depending on the wind that day, the mark, you know, the wind out of the blue, the smell out over lower Manhattan, and it was a stench, or it blew it out over the Hudson River into Jersey. And so you, maybe you got a, a reprieve for a day or two. Anyway, um, that's my recollection. And with the 20th anniversary of 9-11, just hours away. I'm a little bit fearful this year. Partly because it's the 20th anniversary, but partly because of what's happened over the course of the last month and a half with the United States, and Afghanistan, and the Taliban, and the destruction of a 20-year effort. So, I'll leave it there. <laughs>